Hello, everybody. Welcome to this webinar brought to you by Bursa Malaysia and that's managed by our company LifeChamp. Today, our webinar title is EV Technologies at a Profound Inflection Point. So my name is Shen Chu. I'm the moderator for this uh, webinar. Now, electric vehicle industry is an exciting industry because there are a lot of new technologies that are put in place. And this is an industry that uh, a lot of investors, especially growth investors, put their emphasis on because there seems to be a lot of growth opportunities coming from this sector. So today, we've invited an expert or some, uh, rather a full-time investor who has spent a lot of time and resources to study this space to share with us uh, what he thinks about this EV industry. Now, before we begin, as usual, disclaimer, whatever we share in this webinar is only for educational purpose. In no way that I give any recommendation for you to buy or sell any list of securities that we mentioned here. If you decide to make any investment decisions, you're 100% responsible for all your investment risk. Allow me to introduce our speaker today. He is none other than Mr. David Poe, who is the co-founder and managing director of Spiral Thinker Group. Now, David is a thinker, wealth creator, and value seeker. He's an engineer by training. He's now a full-time private investor. He also served as a portfolio consultant, and he's dedicated his time to advocate intelligent value investing as I believe in long-term wealth creation with equities. So that is a brief profile from David. So uh, without further ado, let us welcome David to our webinar today. So David, how are you today? Hi, Shane. Thank you for inviting me back again. Um, I do have to apologize because I'm feeling under the weather. Um, a lot of my team members are done with COVID for the second time, and I'm suffering from some sort of uh, uh, complication on my throat. So I'll do my best to deliver a good show tonight. All uh, right. I so pace speak. yourself <laughs> in this session. And uh, thank you so much for uh, coming to do this segment for us, even though you are feeling under the weather. Okay, appreciate it. All yeah, right. No problem. Um, so as you mentioned, I will try my best to deliver this, but I will speak a bit slowly today. All right. No worries. I have designed the slides to um, be more descriptive so that you can refer back to the slides, to the video after the, show, after the webinar, if you miss out some things, okay? And, um, but uh, I just want to clarify something. Um, myself, I'm in no way um, an expert in automotive or EV. I pride myself to be a uh, market observant. I we invest a lot in uh, semiconductor and especially around the theme of uh, EV and automotive. But you are right to say that uh, this is definitely a growth sector that um, uh, I don't think that any investor should, um, uh, how to say, should ignore in the future because this is definitely going to be uh, an explosive growth for, in the market on, on, for, for, for this particular trend. And rightly so, now I believe that we are just at the inflection point. So I think this uh, webinar is very timely. Um, I will explain again uh, this session uh, through a few topics, right? So we're going to start by talking a little bit on the policies as well as the market trends. And from there on, you understand why. Uh, tonight, I want to talk about the wide band gap semiconductors or what we call WBG semiconductors. And then I will touch a little bit on ADAS as well. In fact, both of these topics are not foreign. Uh, I did, uh, we have touched on both these topics in the previous webinars before, but for tonight, I'm going to go much deeper into the WBG as well as the ADAS topics. So bear with me, right? Now, I'm not going to spend too much time on case studies tonight because most of the case studies are the same, but I hope that you pay attention, especially on the uh, initial uh, parts because these are very important, right? Okay, now to start things off, uh, let's talk about the policies. Uh, what are the policies that are shaping, you know, the EV advancement uh, uh, recently, as well as the market trends. Now, as we know, the fact the major factors they are 
extinguishing you know, the uh, growth of EV is first and foremost environmental concerns, right? Um, thanks to social media, thanks to a lot of push from governments, thanks to you know, the new generation, um, actually they are growing greater awareness of the how, why we need to protect the environment moving forward. So the key theme surrounding this is essentially the decarbonization policies, right? So whatever that we are seeing today, a lot of the growth, especially in the uh, economy as well as the technologies, right, is actually driven by the decarbonization policies, right? We're talking about solar, renewable energy, EV, net zero, all these are because coming from the uh, decarbonization policies, which is a subset of the entire ESG framework, the environmental, social, and governance framework, right? And focusing on the E. But of course, you can talk all you want. If you do not have the technologies to support this, it cannot happen as well. So the technologies for this has been evolving more throughout the years, throughout the decades. And I believe that, we really believe that we are just sitting on the infection point now before things really accelerate. Then other than that, of course, price must be correct. If there is enough policies, if there's a technology to support, to, to fulfill, to realize these policies, but the price is not right, right? The economic uh, uh, structure is not, is not ready to support this. It is not going to happen as well. So that is why there must be a balance between supply and demand to support this uh, uh, decarbonization policies, especially surrounding the EV space. Okay, then of course, again, uh, what the policies that the, the policies which has been enacted, which been enforced, including tax incentives, you know, uh, governmental programs, uh, and uh, most importantly, the industry player has to buy in this idea. They have to support these policies because without the industry players, uh, nothing can be done as well. All right, then of course, with buy ins, we need commitments from uh, stakeholders uh, across the board. Right, so that is why uh, these are all the factors that are contributing to the growth of the EV moving forward. Okay, now next. Now I know that um, actually, uh, I don't know whether you realize actually for the past many years, the uh, policies that are surrounding the EV is actually focusing on what we call the LDV or light uh, duty vehicles. Um, that's why we, we, we have uh, the passenger vehicles, right? Um, but moving forward, all right, as, you can, as I will explain later on, there are more and more um, focus surrounding the heavy duty segment. So this will include your public transport, this will include your logistics, your vans, your lorries, your, um, your trains, so on and so forth. And with this, right, actually, there is there's pushing the need, you know, for the uh, semiconductors content, which I will share a bit later, or share more in detail later. But what I want to highlight here is from now until the next foreseeable five to 10 years, the focus will still be on the light duty segment, all right? Light duty segment. Um, different countries have committed to different. Um, different commitments, different time to realize this commitment. Uh, but this is, uh, please don't take it, uh, uh, this, uh, accept that this is a uh, variable um, milestone. So things can change. Case in point, I think just a couple of days ago, the Prime Minister of UK, I think uh, Prime Minister Sunak, so Sunak he announced that uh, the Great Britain needs to push back push a little bit back for the uh, net 100% uh, electrified uh, uh, policies by another five years from 2030 to 2035. Now, I know that he has gotten a lot of uh, negative uh, press about this, but if you ask me whether it's happening in 2030 or 2035 or somewhere after that, doesn't matter. What matters is the big trend is moving forward, right? And many uh, more and more countries are jumping on the bandwagon Right, mark my words. And then other than the light uh, duty vehicle segment, in fact, uh, the heavy duty segment is gonna gain a lot of attention as well, as uh, and including the EVSC policies, which stands for the EV supply equipment. So it's not just about cars, it's about 
the uh, uh, the the infrastructure, the ecosystem that supports the growth of the EV, right? Okay. So if you want to get more information about this, there's a lot, a lot of information from the IEA website. Please do uh, visit this website when you're free or if you want to know more about these policies. Now, then from policies, they'll come framework. So if you've got a good set of policies, you get a buy-in for industries, you also need a proper framework for things to happen so that things can be realized uh, systematically. So I'm not sure whether you heard about this. This is the KCASE or CASE framework, which stands for Connected Device, Connected uh, Vehicles, Autonomous Vehicles, uh, Shared, uh, shared uh, Subscription-Based, and Electrification. Now, these are the framework that will drive the EV uh, investments moving forward. We talked about, about uh, the electrification framework before this, but this uh, EV is much more about, it's much more than electrification. More and more attention is actually being poured and more and more investments are actually focusing on the ADAS, uh, which is the Advanced Driver Assistance Systems. Uh, and uh, the theme now is these ADAS are not the typical ADAS that you and I know today. These are the AI-powered ADAS, very, very powerful, very advanced. And this is two words autonomous driving or what we call FSD, full self-driving in a, uh, I think this is a term coined by Tesla team, right? And not other than that, other than the A and the E, actually there are many other aspects to this. So there is a connected, then there is a uh, subscription as well. But of course, it may be too early to talk about this now. For now, I think if you can focus your attention and your resources as well as your investments, into this A and the E framework, I think you should be set up pretty well already. Remember this, um, if there's a big one of the biggest takeaway from tonight, actually it is this slide, all right? Now, then from the K, uh, CASE framework, where are the sectors or where are the uh, areas of the market that will have the biggest growth? Now I took this uh, projection from a uh, Jeffrey's research, uh, just very recently they put, they published this research back in July. It's called the next up cycle begins. Okay, now, so from here, as you can see, from 2021 to 2031, there's a span of 10 years. They believe that the long-term prospects of automotive chip makers remain very, very strong due to the mega trends like electrification, autonomous driving, uh, increase uh, confidence safety within the car so and so forth, which is part of the case framework that we talk about. And among these, actually the two segments that were, that is projected to bring to, 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 to beget the highest growth is actually the EV or HEV. Uh, this is basically the electrification as well as the ADAS, right? Now ADAS, uh, according to this projection, um, from 2021 to 2031 is projected to grow the compounding annual growth rate of 15% per annum. So which means it's doubling um, every uh, five years, for the five years, whereas the electrification uh, actually is com will compound even a little bit fa faster than the ADAS, right? So that is why uh, this explains to, 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 the, to, to you, the audience, why tonight I want to focus on these two particular topics. Now, but of course, um, at Spiral Thinker, as well, um, uh, you know, webinars are organized by uh, LifeCham, all right, and uh, supported by Bosa Malaysia. Tonight is not the first time we talk about this. In fact, we have been talking about uh, these topics or similar topics since 2020. I remember that the first time uh, I touched on this topic is back in 2020, November. And interestingly, interestingly it wasn't a uh, planned topic. It was something that was uh, added at the end, you know, and extra sessions. So I told Shane, I told Chun Sien, hey, I think we should talk about automotive semiconductors because it is a growing trend. So those that in that, in that session, we I introduced, uh, you know, we focus on electrification semiconductors. We talk about MLCCs. We talk about MCUs. We talk about IGBTs. Then in 2021, uh, because the response was very good from the audience, so we decided to to focus, dedicate two topics in 2021 to talk about EV or things that are related to that. So that is why in 2021, we had two. And then the second session in 2021, we touched, we, I introduced a little bit about 
what is a wide band gap semiconductor. Now tonight, I'm going to further expand this topic to focus on the silicon carbide space. Okay. Now, last year in 2022, uh, I touched a bit more on battery technologies. So tonight, I won't be talking about battery technologies. Uh, in, in other than WBG, I'll be talking about the ADAS as well. Okay, so without much further ado, make sure you stay until the end, yeah, because I've got a bonus at the end. Right, all of us know that silicon is the heart, is at the heart of semiconductor. Why? The reason is very simple, because silicon is, is, a, is a great semiconductor. It is cheap, it is easily available. In fact, I think silicon is the second or third uh, largest um, uh, uh, material in the world. All right. So, um, but semi-silicon has a lot of limitations, right? Uh, re regardless of its benefits. Um, then, that, so that forms the first generation of uh, materials that form the silica semiconductor uh, that we know today. And moving on, the second generation is actually where we have more advanced or what we call uh, materials called like gallium arsenide. Indian phosphate, which actually powered a lot of the uh, LEDs, the power, sorry, the photovoltaic industry that as we know today. But the problem is with these uh, compounds or materials is that they are very rare, all right? They're very rare. And uh, unfortunately, they are very poisonous. And thus, it is, um, their production is actually quite hazardous to the environment. But we do not have um, any alternative for this now, all right? There are very important materials in the photovoltaic cells, as well as other semiconductor components that we are using today, especially in the optoelectronics devices space. Moving on is what we where we have the third generation, or what we call the wide band gap semiconductors. Now, um, this is mainly it is actually a natural progression. Um, why we are moving from here to here? I'll explain in the next few slides. All right. So in short, um, the wide band gaps actually has a very specific electrical properties in your materials that allow them, that, that make them to become very suitable uh, for applications in high voltage, high frequency, and they can sustain very high temperature environment. All right, now, how, why are they so special, All right? Um, now, this slide is gonna be a little bit technical, but I'll try, I'll do my best to make it sim to simplify for you guys, because it is very uh, important for you to understand what is the underlying um, framework, oh, sorry, the underlying, the, 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 how, it, how a semiconductor works. Okay, now let's focus on this big chart first. As we know, there are basically two types of material, right? Number one, there is an insulator. Now insulator are solid uh, the things that do not conduct electricity, meaning no matter what, how much uh, voltage you pump into this material, you will never, never conduct electricity. For example, wood, for example, cement, all right, they will not uh, um, um, conduct electricity. And why? The reason is because they, they in every um, material, they, they exist two planes of energy, what we call the balance band and the conduction band. Now the balance band is where, you know, the atoms in the material uh, sit still in layman's term. And whereas on the conduction band is the energy level where um, the atoms can, the electrons in the atom can freely move. And when electrons move, they carry current and thus completing the circuit. That's why they can conduct electricity. On the other hand, the conductor has the balance band and the conduction band intertwined together. That is why in any state or in any temperature, in any, in any physical state, these materials can conduct electricity without any issue, without any resistance. Now, in between these two materials, there sits a very interesting middle ground, what we call the semiconductor, whereby the, the, the distance between the band gap, what we call, now the band gap is basically the level of energy that is required an electron from the balance band to a conduction band. But it does not mean that the electron has to move somewhere. No, it's basically just a uh, energy level of the electron. 
So what we can do, what can we do to uh, excite, to uh, upgrade an uh, electron from the balance band to a conduction band? We can apply, it, the energy can either come from thermal energy from the surrounding, or we can uh, apply some sort of uh, energy to the semiconductor to excite the uh, electrons just enough so they can jump from the balance to the conduction band and thus completing uh, having enough energy to for, for them to, to conduct the electrons, uh, sorry, to make the electrons move. And thus, that is how electricity is being conducted. Now, as you can see here, there are a few uh, elements that we can, uh, that I've showed here. Now, um, this talks so basically this is the band gap energy, uh, the, 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 the energy that is required to excite an electron from the balance band to a conduction band. Now you can see here, actually silicon has very low band gap energy. So for silicon, this band gap is actually very, very narrow. Germanium has the lowest, but silicon is very near. On the, on the other hand, diamond has a very huge uh, band gap energy of 5.47 to be exact. So diamond has very wide one, which is very close to an insulator, which does not conduct electricity, right? Now in between these, with a wide, wide band gap energy of between two to four electron volts sits this uh, very special compounds called like silicon carbide and gallium nitride. Now, of course, there are many other compounds that fit into these, but those that are very well known and uh, easily uh, producible are these, for example, here, all right? Now, one of the things, now you can study the electric, electrical properties later on from here, but one of the things that I want to highlight is actually the critical few of the uh, band gap semiconductor is called, which is uh, denoted as the Emax. The Emax for silicon carbide is nine times of that silicon, which means that the band gap of silicon carbide is nine times bigger than that of silicon. Now you may be wondering, so what does that mean? How does it help silicon carbide to be a much better conductor, um, a semiconductor than the silicon? Uh, that we know of, right? So to explain that, actually, I want to focus on, I want to talk about this slide, all right? Um, so we started from, from this uh, spider web diagram, we highlight a few uh, physical properties that are inherent in the wide band gap semiconductor that makes them so um, usable, so suitable in very specific, um, very specific um, um, application. Let's talk about the properties first. Now, wide band gas, yeah, I, I already explained this. Now, they have a much higher breakdown voltage. Now, this breakdown voltage is related to the critical electric field, which I talked about just now. Uh, so for SIC particularly, the critical field is nine times stronger than the, silicon, uh, than the normal silicon. What that means is, the silicon carbon material can withstand a much, much, much higher voltage compared to the uh, silicon before the material breaks down. Now, we want to avoid the breaking down. Why? Because when we, uh, when we, uh, when the voltage uh, is exceeding this breakdown voltage, the material become unstable. And when that happens, we the semiconductor, the the superconductor is not cannot be controlled and thus the electrical system will break down and we want to avoid that. So as you can see here, the electric field, silicon, uh, all right, maybe I just magnify a little bit. Now silicon has the lowest range here. Then uh, actually the silicon carbide is uh, much better than here. And of course the best is the, actually the gallium nitride. Now, later on towards the end of the slide, to, for this session I'll explain why gallium nitride is not as popular as silicon carbide for now, okay? Then other than that, now because of the higher uh, electron velocity as well, now the silicon carbide as well as gallium nitride are much better at uh, uh, conducting higher, faster switching speed uh, as a semiconductor compared to the silicon. Now as well as other but, uh, parameters or other properties like the hard, uh, they, they are, have a much higher thermal conductivity, conductivity means that the wide banking materials can be operate can operate in a much uh, 
hotter environment uh, and by and plus because of the high thermal con conductivity they can dissipate the heat much better than the silicon and this is very important because a lot of application now especially in the industrial especially in EV especially in automotive especially in space we require these very specific characteristics for the semiconductor to perform as uh, as expected okay now of course there are these are the benefits and uh, that you can see here uh, then there are these are the uh, some of the uh, sample compounds that uh, of uh, which which makes up the wide band gap semiconductors and from here actually the most um, industrially in terms of the industrial use your know, application the most um, uh, suitable ones are actually the silicon carbide and the gallium nitride okay now remember this this is very important right so let's zoom in on the silicon carbide For this. Now let's look, excuse me. Now let's look at this chart. As you can see here, um, this denotes the switching speed or the frequency, the switching right of the semiconductor that can it can it can deliver. And on the vertical, this is the power that it can withstand or it can deliver as well. Now for the silicon, actually silicon is very useful. And it is widely accepted for low power and low switching frequency uh, applications uh, like your day-to-day -day electronics the computers that we know but as we move on to applications or industries that require higher power and much higher switching speed silicon cannot make it ready that is why because of the properties that i explained just now silicon carbide is actually more suitable now you guys can see here Silicon carbide can, can actually um, deliver more power compared to silicon carbide. And relatively, they can operate, they can actually give higher, they can actually operate in higher switching frequency as well. But of course, in terms of the switching frequency, GAN is definitely the winner here. So, in terms of usage, as you can see, for the low to medium voltage um, applications, the GAN uh, material, the GAN semiconductor is actually much more preferred. Now, that is why I think a lot of you, uh, I am sure that you have uh, known these uh, uh, very fast charging charges for your smartphones, right? Uh, whether you can buy it from uh, brands like Ugreen, then, then you can see this uh, very, uh, I think, fast charging. You can, you can charge your phone to 100% in less than half an hour, 20 minutes or so. And uh, more, more often than not, these devices will have a gun, again, power uh, chip inside. Then, for the higher uh, voltages, uh, which is above the 600, 800, or 900 volts, this is where the silicon, I mean, above these, these uh, applications, you, the silicon may not be able to, 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 to provide already. So that's why we need the SIC materials to support these uh, high voltages uh, uh, applications. And because of these, there has been a lot of investments which has been focusing around the silicon carbide space, whether it is from the raw mat, from the processing, the manufacturing of the wafers, or so for you name it, right? And a lot of money has been poured into this space for many years. And I just, I believe that we are just sitting on the infection point. And we, the, the growth is, is not, has, has not really started yet. So that is why I think now is the best time for us to look at, into this, All right? This is just for your information. Now, who was the uh, company, which is the company that actually first makes silicon carbide so popular? It is none other than Tesla. So, back in uh, 2018, Tesla, uh, because they want to mass produce their Model 3, they were the first automotive player to adopt silicon carbide MOSFET. Now, before the uh, emergence of the silicon carbide MOSFET, uh, power semiconductor, almost every automotive player, they were using silicon-based uh, uh, MOSFET or silicon-based IGBTs, insulated bed, uh, insul insulated uh, gate bipolar transistors, right? Now, now these uh, IGBTs, they are good. I mean, they are suitable for normal automotive, but when it comes to EV, that requires much higher voltages uh, as well as uh, requires a much a stringent uh, switching uh, cap cap uh, capability. The silicon-based uh, semiconductors 
uh, cannot make it ready. And it's why um, uh, Elon Musk and the Tesla team were the pioneers to use silicon carbide based MOSFET in their uh, power inverters for their motors, as you can see here. So the uh, IDM that uh, supplied the uh, transistors, the, sorry, the uh, SIC MOSFET to Tesla was none other than uh, say ST Micro. Now at that time, ST Micro had a contract from Cree, which is uh, has, has, has already been bought over by Wolf Speed, right? So Cree supplied the raw mat as well as the wafer to um, ST Micro, which then produces for using the wafer and the raw mat. Uh, the silicon carbide semiconductors to be used in the Tesla Model 3, right? So this is the this is what really kick off, you know, um, the excitement about silicon carbide based uh, power semiconductors. So what's the deal about the recent uh, announcement by Tesla or by Elon Musk that they say, oh, now we are going to use 75% less silicon carbide in the future. This uh, news came out sometime in early March this year, and it caused a ripple effect throughout the industry, right? Uh, those companies that are, or it has invested in silicon carbide, their share price tank. Companies are on semi, IC, micro, wood speed, they all came down. But this news is, in my opinion, is already over sensationalized. Um, but because if you don't study into the detail, you may be uh, petrified, you may be scared. But if you look deeper into the technology, you will realize that actually this is a natural progression. Excuse me. This is the natural progression for the silicon carbide technology. Now, as you can see here, this is a slide by uh, SC Micro. Yeah. Now, SC Micro were the first uh, power semiconductor, SIC based power semiconductor to deliver. Uh, the semiconductor chips, the power chips to Tesla using the first, second, and third gen uh, uh, SIC power MOSFETs. And these are based on the planar technology, right? Planar technology. Moving on, it is a natural progression to move on to the trench technology, whereby physically, yes, you may use uh, different, you may use a much less silicon carbide contained because of the shrinkage of the devices. But that doesn't mean that the uh, silicon carbide is not useful anymore. In fact, on the contrary, I believe that the uh, importance that silicon carbide is getting more and more important because of this trench technology, right? Uh, as, 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 as I will explain here. Now, basically, uh, if you want to know what the trench, what the planar, um, <clears throat> Uh, structure looks like it looks like this. So you know these are the silicon carbide substrate uh, layer that you can see here, right? This is what we call the drift layer. Now for the trench technology, it looks like this. So physically, it looks a little bit less compared to here, all right. But it is actually a natural progression. Why? Because uh, the trench uh, structure has a lot of uh, advantages compared to the planar structure. Uh, whereby they have they can but they can give a much lower on the resistance now naturally any devices they will have uh, some sort of resistance for you to power on so remember switching is about on off on off one zero one zero one zero so before he achieved one for the electron for for the circuit to complete and you like the current to flow through the system must overcome this on the resistance first right and in this regard, the trench structure, the trench technology offers a much lower on, re uh, on resistance. And because of that, uh, as well as other physical parameters and physical properties, the trench technology uh, also can provide lower switching loss because of, especially when you have a, a very high switching requirement. And because of these two combined, the device can be much smaller now. And because of this, that is why it leads to, uh, the leads to this uh, Tesla announcing that in the future, they're going to use less uh, silicon carbide material in their future cars. Now, I believe uh, from our research, right, uh, from industry experts like semi analysis, you know, fabricated knowledge, as well as uh, industry players, that actually this is a natural progression. Why? Because 
in order for Tesla to, to be successful in their mass models, they have to bring down the cost. And one of the ways to bring down the cost is to, to make, it, make the devices smaller and lighter, okay? So in this regard, SC Micro, from what I gather, is kind of struggling to achieve the uh, next generation trench technology in the SIC MOSFETs. Other places have already done it. Now, Infineon is very interesting. Infineon was a late player in the SIC, but they did not start in the planar technology. They straight away jump to the trench technology. And that is why Infineon, uh, in the past couple of years, they have grown leaps and bounds in the uh, uh, dominance of the SIC technology. You can, you can uh, look deeper into this. There are a lot of things, there are a lot of uh, uh, investment opportunities surrounding this as well. But of course, there are other players like Rome, uh, Fuji Electric, and so on and so forth. This, uh, by all means, is not an exhaustive uh, list. There are many players, right? Okay, so uh, you, can, you can dig deeper into it if you want. Now, so where are these silicon carbide material used in the EV? So, Typically, um, these are the major subsystems where the SIC is being used. So we got the fast charging system, uh, whereby the off-board uh, charging, uh, we got on-board charging for the AC, you know, what we call the slow charging. The power train system, especially the inverters, uses a lot of uh, uh, silicon carbon materials. And this is just an example. This is an example of the inverter uh, used by uh, Tesla in the Model 3, okay? Um, then, uh, of course, other than that, they've got the DC to DC converter because you need to step down the voltage from the uh, 400 or 800 volts batteries to the much lower voltage to power the uh, subsystems in the EV. Okay. Now, so as I mentioned just now, uh, one of the case study, uh, very successful uh, case study uh, earlier is actually this company called Rome. They JV with this uh, F1 uh, racer company called Venturi, whereby they actually use their SIG module, their silicon carbon module in the inverter. So within a span of two seasons, they were able to reduce the weight of the power inverter from uh, 15 kilo to 9 kilogram, uh, whereby reducing the size to 30% while maintaining the maximum power output of 220 kilowatts. So this is one of the use cases and why this is so important. Now, of course, other than the Tesla Model 3, uh, more and more EV makers and automotive makers are actually coming on to use silicon carbide in the uh, lineup of uh, EVs as well as cars. Now, as you can see here, this is the 400 volt uh, range. This is the 800 volt range. There are more and more uh, focus on the 1,200 volt range as well, especially on the heavy UTD segment, which I explained earlier on in my slides, right? So other than Tesla, I think the other big adopters, the other major adopters of uh, SIC include BYD, Kia, Hyundai, Lucid, so on and so forth. Now, one thing I want to highlight here is the more powerful is the requirement of the EV, which means that they require a much higher voltage system to operate in. They will require much more silicon carbide content in the EV, all right? So whatever that we know today, the mass model, right? Yes, they operate in the 400 range, but I think moving forward, there'll be more and more focus on the higher voltage range EVs as well. And this in turn will drive more uh, demand for SIC, right? So now with uh, the technology iterations, with more advancement in the technology, cost has to come down as well before the market, uh, before the adoption can increase. So as we can see here, because of the iterations of the technology, whereby more and more scientists are joining the bandwagon, you know, more and more players are coming into the picture, right? The silicon carbide, the uh, um, cost of the dye, uh, the, the chip the, or the dye cost is projected to come down around 50% from 2022 to 2030. And I believe this will be a key factor to drive more adoption of the silicon carbide as the uh, preferred uh, power semiconductor in the EVs moving forward. Excuse me. So I'm gonna take a bit more time to uh, explain this uh, because this slide will explain 
what are the major development that uh, that gave me to 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 came out that came out with this title for tonight's webinar, where I believe that EV is just at the inflection point towards acceleration because of the advancement in silicon carbide, which which will actually drive more adoption, more take up on this silicon carbide as the preferred material. Now we see a uh, we do see a significant uptick in the shift in priorities moving forward. Previously, the focus is surrounding a surrounding the uh, the workability of the silicon carbide. Can silicon carbide actually work or not? Is it really suitable? And uh, technology has proven that it is so. So the focus is actually shifting from the technology benefit to the like, economical evaluation economical evaluation of the material to securing to securing the the uh, 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 required amount of material for future expansion right and because of this there, there are, the, there's a lot of changes in the market especially the major players they are trying to expand the market share through uh, significant capex spending or mnas right strategy mnas case in point I think, uh, as you know, I think from the uh, from the recent news uh, under the unwind administration, you will really hear that Infineon is spending a lot of money in Gulin, right, to build a new capacity for the silicon carbide, right. So this is part of it. This is part of the uh, two billion euro capex uh, around the world, and uh, we stand to benefit because Infineon has a very big plant up north near Gulin, right. Uh, SC Micro is also building their mega factory for the uh, silicon carbide uh, production. Uh, Wolf Speed is also expanding. Wolf Speed is actually perhaps the biggest spender in this space. And unfortunately, because they are the earlier adopter, and that's why I think they are suffering a little bit because Wolf Speed uh, has yet to reach the uh, uh, optimum yield or uh, production of the silicon carbide uh, wafer and materials uh, for the IDMs to use, okay? Now there are, uh, there are a lot of uh, MNAs as well, especially MNAs to acquire technology, wafer technology, or even uh, machines you know, from here, machines to, for cutting edge technologies to support the ecosystem, the, uh, the, the, the ecosystem. Now, case in point, uh, recently ASM acquired LPE for the epitaxial reactors as well as uh, their intellectual properties. I think this is a very uh, um, uh, important milestone. And then just a couple of months ago, Vico acquired this company called Abilu Vega Epitaxi Player for their chemical vapor deposition systems. And these are uh, the development in the market that show us that there are a lot of serious uh, money pouring into silicon carbide. And these are development that will drive further adoption of silicon carbide. And thus, in return, uh, the advancement of the EV technology, right? Of course, other than that, uh, there is also a lot of talk, as I mentioned earlier on, from uh, switching from planar to trench technology. And now they're talking about from doing a 16-inch to an 8-inch uh, wafer to increase the yield. So all in all, you're looking at the big picture, right? With cost coming down, with better performance and higher adoption, uh, myself as well as my team at Spiral Income, we do believe that this is just, we are, we are aligned. Uh, I think the market is just uh, aligned perfectly um, for, from an election, from an infection point towards acceleration in the next many years to come. Mark my words, right? So it is impossible for us to really um, uh, decipher who are the players in this uh, entire ecosystem. There are just so many players. But I believe that there is going to be a lot of consolidation moving forward as uh, bigger players get more market share. They got more money to spend. There are more strategy MNS as well. All right. But um, you can study a lot to do this. Actually, you can get this slide from your group. Uh, your group is a very, uh, very, very intuitive, very insightful resources. You can get a lot of, info, a lot of information there. Now, but what you can maybe what you need to know is actually who are the major sick waiver suppliers. There are people like Wall Speed, uh, Coherent, uh, then the Chinese players. We've got people like uh, Tanky Blue, we've got Sun and IC, which is uh, uh, getting a lot of uh, 
uh, traction these days because uh, Sandon, Sandon IC, they actually spend a lot of KPEX and uh, some of the companies listed in Malaysia stand to benefit from the expansion. Then we got other players like Soitec. Now on the Epitaxi, we got uh, players like XFAT who has a, uh, a foundry uh, in Sarawak, uh, coaching Sarawak. Then we got uh, the major players for the chip processing, for the transistors, for the packaging, including Finion, uh, Rome, SMA, go so on and so forth. These are the major players. Okay, right. So um, this is what I'm going to end here for the Silicon Carbide. So I hope I give you a, a, into the, a, a big picture of why Silicon Carbide is uh, gaining traction, why they are so important uh, in the EV, uh, in the explosive growth of the EV. Okay, now give me a couple of seconds. I need to catch my breath here. <laughs> Now, moving on, um, I'm going to move on to the next topic, which is ADAS. Now, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to spend too much time on ADAS, uh, but just to give you an idea, uh, what are the components and why is ADAS getting more and more important, especially towards the full autonomy, right? Right. Now, as we know, um, ADAS is Advanced Driver Assistance Systems, all right? It is in short called ADAS. ADAS is not new. The earliest form of ADAS is what we call the ABS, uh, or Anti-Lock Braking System. I believe almost all the cars today would have the ABS installed in them. This is the basic, basic uh, ADAS system that we will have. Now, uh, chances are if you have bought a, the new car, in the past few years, you would have other features like the lane departure system, the warning system, the adaptive cruise control, the forward collision system, the pedestrian detection, so on and so forth. Now these are the ADA system, which is already here today. And they are actually in towards the autonomy um, uh, a target. They actually, in terms of the safety level, they are basically what we call the level zero level one and level two system only, okay? Lane departure, adaptive to cruise, cruise control. And even, I think that there are new cars that have even had the traffic jam assist now. I think, I'm not sure about the Proton uh, X50 uh, or X70 that you buy today. I'm not sure whether they have these, but I'm very certain they will have these as well. Now, of course, moving forward, we don't stop at level three because according to the Society of Automotive Engineering, they define five levels of autonomy uh, for, for the industry to move forward to. So this is the expansion of this simple chart here uh, from level one to level five. So in short, level zero is where the driver has 100% full control of the car, whereas level five is totally always controlled by the uh, system, by the computer in the car, right? So, uh, so um, in the level two, they actually split up. Uh, we recently, they actually expanded the level two to level two plus and level two plus plus. Now, in my opinion, I think the same will happen to level three and level four when the time is near. So right now, with the level two, we already have partial automation. Now, I'm sure a lot of you have seen uh, the YouTube video of some of the Tesla drivers um, completely hands off the cars while they are driving, while the car is driving on the highway, right? So this is what we call the highway piloting system uh, where we have level two or level two plus kind of uh, autonomy. Moving forward, um, naturally there'll be more advanced autonomy uh, whereby we even have valet parking, full autopilot. In fact, um, there are actually some countries that already allow for full autopilot for a certain segment of the automotive uh, sector. For example, robo-taxis. Actually, robo-taxis is uh, considered by uh, the, the early adopters of the auto full autopilot system. Now, of course, um, the system is not perfect. It's far from perfect. I'm sure you have seen in the YouTube, whereby the robo-taxis are causing massive jam in very highly dense cities like uh, New York City, right, so on and so forth. So believe me, there are still a lot of iterations to be fulfilled, to go through before we can find a, a, suit, a working system, a, a minimum issue working system, but it's gonna happen. 
Now, of course, for these um, levels to advance, what is what needs to be there? What do we need in terms of semiconductor or the subsystem in, in a electric in a vehicle to uh, to enable this uh, this advancement in the autonomy level? Okay. So, in the layman's term, the increasing demand for ADAS will require number one more sensors, and number two more cameras, and to drive this uh, like uh, uh, components, you need more semiconductor. You need uh, you need advanced uh, processing chips, as we, which I will show later, right? So basically, there are basically four types of uh, sensors which is used in ADAS. We've got the radar, which is using radio wave for the ranging and detection. We've got lidar, which is using light or lasers. Um, which is uh, this lidar is called light. Uh, detection and raging system. We've got the camera, which uses visual, the uh, image prep processing. Then we've got the ultrasonic as well, uh, especially at the, at the back, and which are, these are using sound, or what we call sonars, all right? Then of course, there are other components, which is, which is uh, designed to monitor, for example, the driver, the eye, the eye level of the driver, to see whether the driver is nodding off, to see whether the driver is uh, sleeping, then the data system will trigger an and alert or alarm to wake up the driver. Uh, of course, last but not least, we got the autom automated driving uh, system, uh, which is uh, still in a pretty early development stage today. Now, of course, today, uh, with the limited ADAS features that we know, we will require mostly the radar, the, the camera, the sonars or the ultrasonic sensors, but moving on, as we move towards the uh, higher level autonomy, there will be more sensors and uh, cameras, or the re uh, ranging devices which will require to 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 fulfill the demands for more advanced ADAS features. Okay, and other than the sensors, actually the computing power, the uh, computing capacity also need to catch up, right? Because you can see here. Um, today, we are talking about 70 tops or what we call tera uh, operations per second. And uh, when we have, uh, we are reaching uh, full autonomy, I believe we will need more than 1,000 tops of processing power to enable uh, this uh, full autonomous driving. Now, of course, in this uh, evolution as well, there is this thing called data fusion because all these different sensors will give different inputs to the EV system. To the ADA system, and these uh, different different inputs uh, will require different types of processing, as well as shown here. Now, for example, to enable adaptive cruise control, we need a long range radar in front of the camera. For the shorter term, especially from the back, we require the short range radar or the medium range radar around the cars here. All right. Then, for other features like the lane departure system the traffic uh, sign recognition, the surround view cameras, then we require cameras. Uh, then for pedestrian detection, we require uh, LiDAR. Now, there is this a problem here already. You see, this different sensor will give different types of input to the ADA system. The radar is basically giving you, you know, whenever you watch a movie, when the submarine goes under the under the sea, or when you watch uh, this, uh, the uh, the fighter plane uh, moon, the movies like Top Gun. Then when you use radar, right? Basically, you are using radio waves. So the input here is the signal is actually wave, the wave, the radio uh, frequency or the radio uh, uh, what we call envelope to feed into here. Lidar will use the two D uh, uh, three or three D diagram to feed into. Camera is using image, and uh, ultrasonic using sound sound waveform. So all these different different um, uh, signals have to go through what we call a sensor fusion to for so that the ADAS computer can make sense of what these are and they can process the signals and provide the vehicle or the EV or the autonomous vehicle with the right corrective uh, countermeasures. For example, whether you need to slow down or you need to slow down the complete stop or you need to accelerate in the turn all these will come from this chip here. Now, this is the processor 
whereby you need to have uh, this breaking uh, this broken down into two parts, the sensor fusion, as well as the uh, ADAS, um, or the, what we call the autonomous driving machine learning AI platform. Now, from what I gather now, of what is uh, the accepted uh, industry standard, FPGA is a de facto uh, processor for the sensor fusion, whereby a multi uh, microprocessor or a SOC would be, should, would be the preferred um, um, uh, architecture or the solution for the autonomous driving and the AI platform. Now, of course, in the future, this will change because there are a lot of uh, study, a lot of advancement uh, development into this space. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't think there are many, there are any companies in Malaysia that are uh, involved in this supply chain, uh, not in a direct sense. But moving forward, I think this, this, uh, this uh, uh, space would definitely expand and there'll be more players coming to the picture, all right? So this is basically uh, why it's required for ADAS. And that is why the requirement for ADAS, the uh, total uh, addressable market, which is expected to grow at a very high uh, compounding annual growth rate. So the key takeaway here is with every progression in ADAS level towards autonomy, uh, the semiconductor content per electric per automotive per vehicle, whether it is a ICE or EV will increase in quantity uh, and this would benefit the um, components like MCU, the microcontroller units, the microprocessors, the cameras, the radars, the lidars, and the sensors. Okay. Now, of, of course, uh, as far as I think, uh, we have already actually started monitoring this space uh, since 2016 as shown from here. And but of course, at that time, uh, there were very limited information or research paper that we can dig. And to be honest, that time there weren't a lot of uh, there were not a lot of uh, investment opportunities as well. Uh, back in 2016, one of the companies that we highlighted uh, was actually KESM because I think back then KESM uh, the management already hinted about ADAS as the future technology that they are looking at. Uh, but of course, I think we were a bit too early uh, in this uh, investment thesis, so we we lost some money. In KSM, but I, I believe that with the development that I've shown you uh, just now, so how, up to this point, I believe the infection points are uh, just on the horizon and we are really towards the acceleration phase for both the WBG as well as the ADAS. Now, the ADAS ecosystem is even more complex because there are just too many players. Um, you can download the uh, very uh, comprehensive ecosystem from this uh, website called or say consulting.net, the, the link is here at the bottom. So you can go and look to this website for a high resolution copy. But basically you can focus on the AV hardware, the, the uh, autonomous vehicle hardware, but these are basically a lot of names that you know already. And in fact, we have talked about this, some of these names, I think in our previous webinars, companies like NXP, On Semiconductor, SD Micro, Denso, ARM, um, these are, and then lately there's a lot of, uh, uh, these are uh, uh, GPU companies, uh, AMD, the Xilinx, the company the Xilinx uh, solution, the ZF, uh, so on and so forth, right? And the, the, I, the, I think this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, in fact, uh, there are so, so a lot more players here, but I believe that there's going to be a consolidation of this industry, right? So among my words, um, this is a very exciting space. And I believe that uh, there are a lot of investment opportunities, especially uh, you have investment overseas and you have access to all these different different investment opportunities. Okay, now 16 minutes. I'm gonna move on to the last topic, which is the case studies. But as I mentioned before, because of our limited exposure in the KSE, um, I'm gonna not gonna spend too much time in this uh, topic here. I think uh, most of the case study that I have uh, tonight, I've already shared before. So there are the names like MPI, uh, Benamaster, which I already shared before. They are still stand to benefit from this uh, acceleration of the EV. But of course, there are new names like the Division, uh, ECA Group, which is uh, recently uh, IPO as well. And there are many, many players. 
All right. So um, I'm going to reiterate my case study on MPI because I think MPI has done a lot of uh, inroad into the SIC space, um, so much so that they were criticized. The management was criticized recently for uh, being too early into the game. Uh, but I think it is the uh, it is not as it is not so simple. It is much more than BCI because in order for you to capture the market, you would you have to bite the bullet and be the first market mover to be the to be the first one to invest in the technology so that when the demand does come, you are ready and you can start production right away. Because if you're not ready when the demands come, right, you may be too late already. So uh, that is why uh, MI, MPI, the, the uh, share price has taken a beating, which I will share later. So as you can see here, this is the roadmap of MPI. Uh, they come a long way from uh, producing, uh, you know, automotive, uh, uh, very simple automotive uh, packaging, to computers, to consumer devices, to sensors, and now to SRC technology, 5G, so on and so forth. So their focus now is actually on the power management as well as the EV. Um, so these are the target segments based on their latest uh, briefing that they, as they say they're going to focus on. Number one, of course, they have their eye, they have their attention very much laser sharp, uh, sorry, the laser focus on the SIC adoption in VVs uh, as well as the sensors. So they, will, they are the MPIs uh, who are going to be a major player in the electrification as well as the ADAS uh, adoption for the EV growth. Now, other than that, of course, they are making a lot of inroads in 5G technology as well. Now, this is an old slide. This is a slide that they always share during the briefing, right? But what I want to focus here is actually the devil is in the details, right? So they actually have mentioned that they have been focusing a lot of their, uh, of their technology in the maps and the sensors, the electrification and sensorization wave. And as, as, I, as I have shown in the ADAS uh, session just now, that the advancement, the, the, the adoption of uh, ADAS require more MAMS and sensors. Now, MAMS is basically the semiconductor component that enables the sensors to work. But of course, to drive the sensors, you need MCU. And then to, to process as well, to, to, to combine all the, uh, the data, the, the data fusion, you need uh, microprocessors. And this is how the story goes, right? So they are also making new design concepts for LiDAR and radar segment. For the power packaging, they have a lot of development for the SIC, for automotive, as well as the power management integrated circuits module. Now, other than SIC, they have already started as well on the gallium nitride as well. Okay. Now, in this, this is from the uh, latest uh, briefing. Uh, based on this is, I think, the M site in Ipo. Um, basically, they have uh, secured the bottom two floors for a Chinese uh, customer. Then, from what I gather from the briefing, I think the, but the top two floors are for future expansion, possibly for new SIC customers. In fact, they already secured a very, very big SIC customer for their S site already, which is also based in Nepal. Now the S site is actually under, uh, currently undergoing expansion whereby they are converting a lot of the uh, car parks as well as the old production space for uh, new uh, testing and uh, equipment space for SIC. I, I think I like, don't need to give too much in uh, their, their SIC uh, customer is actually a major SIC wafer supplier uh, highlighted here. So they are already uh, uh, signed a contract with this customer to provide the packaging solution for the, for the SIC uh, power semiconductors right from here. Now, because of their um, <clears throat> early uh, entrance into the SIC, which it did not take off, and which was uh, flagged by so many bad news, right? Unfortunately, their share price took a beating, uh, all right? So this is the case of a double Davis, uh, a double Davis attack, which I shared in my previous, uh, which I mentioned in my previous uh, webinars as well. So they were a victim of uh, derating of the valuation, plus 
the uh, slowdown on their earnings per share. I think their share price has gone down about close to 50%, 40 over percent for sure. Uh, right now, I think today, this is the price chart, which I snapshot last week. So I think the price is not too much, too, too much different from today. Uh. Um, their P-E ratio, of course, based on historical earnings is very high. But if they can if their earnings can come back and rebound, right? I think the P-E should normalize to maybe 40 to 50 times. Um, their cash flow yield is very impressive at 7%. Uh, despite you know the uh, the, the heavy uh, capex requirement, and they are forty six percent as I mentioned, close to fifty percent below their uh, peak in twenty twenty one of fifty dollars or fifty ringgit already. So I see this as a half uh, glass half full. I believe this is an opportunity if you are a long term investor uh, and you want to benefit in the SIC growth as well as the EV advancement. I think this is one of the companies that you should study in a very serious manner, right? And uh, a very good uh, candidate for your investment. Now, of course, other than that, we've got other uh, equipment players like Penta Master. Uh, in fact, uh, MPI uh, publicly uh, admit that actually they get a lot of, they bought a lot of uh, SIC uh, equipment from Penta Master, especially the Trooper series, right? So Penta Master, they've got wafer level, um, um, wafer, wafer level equipment for the, which is actually designed for SIC wafer, or right, for burning wafer level burning testers for the SIC. They've got the Trooper B14. This is their star pro product. Then what I want to highlight here is other than the MPI as a customer, they are also trying to win other customers from China and from Europe as I'm highlighting here during the uh, latest briefing as well. I believe that they're gonna, they should be able to come out with more products, more testing equipments to supply for the SIC demand. So I, I believe that uh, Panda Master is one of the ATE players that will benefit from this SIC trend. Now, other than that, another major player, which has uh, recently been IPO in this company called ECA. Now, ECA, they have two uh, major business units, the IPS as well as the SAE, standalone automated equipment uh, segment, right? So in the standalone uh, segment, they have actually, uh, this, they, have, they have a very good solution for IGPT. So I believe, uh, just give them time, in their roadmap, they would have um, included SIC or even GAN in their future roadmap already. So I believe that they would, they should be able to benefit in the rising SIC trend, especially for automotive as well. But of course, um, there are many other players in the KSC that are directly or indirectly um, uh, benefiting or stand to benefit in the rising uh, SIC as well as ADAS trend. Now, other than the MPI and Beta Master that I talk about, uh, Inari is also making inroads into automotive, especially in the photonics. Now, photonics is also used in ADAS, especially in the camera and the sensors uh, division uh, requirement, right? Now, uh, Unisem as well, because I think if you dig through my previous webinars, I actually use Unisem. I did talk about Unisem as a case study. Uh, they do stand to benefit because they have a lot of automotive exposure as well, although not as much as uh, MPI. Now, Globetronics is a very interesting company. Now, Globetronics, uh, previously, the way I see Globetronics is they are very successful in reinventing themselves, redefining their business model from quartz uh, timing uh, uh, devices to, sense, to, to lighting LEDs, to sensors. And after sensors, they actually been under the radar for many years. And recently, if you have been studying the annual report uh, since last year, they already started to talk about data sensor fusion. Now, sensor fusion is, uh, if you have uh, if you forgot about it, sensor fusion is this part. Now, I do not know how they, are going, how they will uh, participate in this, but it is already mentioned in the annual report. Now, as Thinker, we did reach out to the management 
but uh, unfortunately, the management did not divulge any information from uh, regarding this. But I believe that uh, if they get the uh, new technology right, uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully they get to re redefine or reinvent, reinvent themselves again. All right. Now, other than that, of course, the other players like Vitrox, QES, MIT Innovation, so and so forth, Genetech, they all stand to benefit from this rising trend. Okay. So, as a conclusion, I'm going to bring out a uh, slide that I shared previously. Growth is always driven, is always driven by consumption and policies. In this webinar tonight, I talk about the policies that are shaping the demand uh, in terms of the demand as a supply side that will drive further consumption, uh, further take up rate for the EV, and which in turn will drive higher demand for materials like SIC, for the components which is surrounding the ADAS uh, ecosystem as well. And uh, from the McKinsey, this is another projection from McKinsey. Uh, between 2021 to 2030, the vertical markets that will enjoy the uh, biggest growth is none other than the automotive, electronics, and industrial electronics. So almost all the industry uh, players, the uh, research, uh, professional research companies are pointing towards this direction. And that is why I believe as an intelligent investor, we should not miss this uh, wave, all right? Now, there may, be, there may be a lot of uncertainty now uh, as the ecosystem is, is reshuffling to find its uh, sweet spot. But with this kind of trend, right, I think it is... Uh, uh, it is wise for us to at least ask some allocation into this investment thesis. All right. So before I give hand over to Shane, a bonus slide for you all. Now I know tonight we talk a lot about SIC, uh, which is sorry. Uh, so SIC here is actually the orange color here. Why? Because of the remember SIC is a suitable uh, third generation wide bank semiconductor for high powered. Uh, application which is required for EV. Now, mark my words, you know that at Spiral Thinker, we are always forward looking. In the future, GAN, GN, or gallium nitride will become more and more important as well. In fact, the adoption of GAN uh, starting in the next couple of years towards 2030 will, will in, my, in my opinion, will overtake uh, SIC as well from here. Now, sorry, uh, actually this color is orange, but they are referring to GAN uh, because I think I took them from different reports. Although currently, the total addressable market, the projected total addressable market for GAN is much smaller than SIC. Uh, in the future, I believe that GAN is going to grow in terms in the adoption, uh, especially in uh, automotive as well as industrial electronics. Right. But for now, it is enough for us to focus our attention on the SIC as well as the ADAS market. Again, so that ends my uh, session for today. Once again, please accept my apologies uh, for my uh, broken horse uh, voice. I've done my best. So I hope that uh, you have at least captured a majority of what I want to share today. All right. Over to you, Shane. Thank you so much, David, for doing this a very enlightening and informative session for us to understand the electric vehicle industry, uh, despite you feeling uh, under the weather. So thank you so much uh, to David. And thank you, everybody, for being a wonderful audience. And thanks for your understanding, for listening to David, even though sometimes you uh, may not be able to hear exactly what he said. You may miss out one word or two. And thank you so much for your uh, understanding. All right. Yeah, so, uh, David. Maybe, maybe I just want to clarify. That is why you noticed that my slide this round has more words. It's uh, more packed. And it is designed in such a way to give more information if you re review the video from YouTube. All right. Uh, thanks for the very thoughtful gesture. All right. So uh, for those of you who are asking, uh, yes, tomorrow you will receive a replay link in case that you miss out some points, want to uh, play back. Tomorrow you will receive a replay link via your registered email address. Um, so we have... Today, we're going to keep our Q&A very short so that we can rest early. 
So if any question to ask David, just put it there, but we'll only be able to manage maybe one or two questions. All right. So the first question is, in your view, David, if the investment idea is right, the silicon carbide growth, what are the advantages of investing into MPI over producers like Wolf Speed? Is there any concern for different silicon carbide producers to avoid using the same OSAT service provider? Oh, Sorry, uh, thank you for the question. So I would like to clarify uh, M MPI, excuse me. MPI do not produce SIC. What MPI does, sorry, maybe I just go to the slide. Huh? MPI is a packaging solution provider for companies like Wolf Speed. So, because as you see here, Wolf Speed, uh, yeah. Wolf Speed actually is involved in the substrate the SIC raw material uh, production. They are also involved in epitaxy. They are involved in the chip design, the power MOSFET design, as well as the packaging. Now, when I say they're involved, it does not necessarily mean that they do this on their own. They would have outsourced some of the processes to companies like MPI, to offsets like MCOR. There are many, many offset players in the region, not just in Malaysia, uh, especially in Korea, especially in Taiwan. There are a lot of uh, packaging. And MPI is just one of the uh, packaging provider all right, they have invested in SIC uh, since a few years ago. So I believe that once the SIC adoption takes off and accelerate, API should stand to benefit. And I think that I do not need to be, I made it very clear enough already, very big hint that one of their customer is actually here. So Sam, I hope you get my hint. <clears throat> Thank you, David. Now, David, both UNICEF and MPI have a plant in China. Do you have any idea why uh, the MPI's profit dip a lot more than uh, UNICEF? Was it because of their exposure to the different segments or different customers? Um, I think to answer the question, you have to find out or compare how much is their China exposure between these two companies. For what I know, MPI recently made a lot of investments in China uh, because they want to capture the SIC growth in the China market. But of course, um, they were met up with a lot of delays in their, in their expansion. They are planned in Suzhou, they are planned in Suxiang, as well as other regions, right? They were actually, that because of COVID, because of the China lockdown, uh, they did not... Uh, but, but advanced as per plan, there were a lot of delays. Lah. So in that regard, I believe there were a lot of negative, there were more negative um, uh, impact on MPI compared to UNICEF. Then again, you have also to look at the shareholding structure between these two companies. Now, it is very hard for myself and my team to buy companies like MPI. Why? Because it is so illiquid. So when the illiquid stocks, when there's a lot of bad news, the share price will tank very fast. But on the contrary, when good news happens, the share price can go up very fast as well. Yeah, so perhaps this is why I can answer to you. All right, thank you so much, David. Um, okay, let's do one last question uh, by Janet. Uh, would PMB Tech, which produces and distributes silicon metal products, benefit from the advancement of EVs? Ah, Janet, this is a very good question. In fact, this is the question that I've been trying to ask the management during the AGS for the past two years. But um, so this is purely my personal opinion because the management did not um, really give a direct answer. Now, the silicon that the PMB tech produces are what we call the lower grade silicon. Now, in order to produce the silicon for semiconductors, 
so much for for the automotive. You need a you need a very pure silicon. So they got grading when they got numbers. I just forget about it. I just forgot the, uh, what are the numbers. It's about the purity of the silicon. All right. So according to the management, they are trying um, their best to produce the kind of purity for semiconductor. Now, currently, they are indirectly benefiting the semiconductor space, but they are not a direct benefit beneficiary. Those in time, in the future, if they put more investment, if they, they hire the right talent, they may uh, they may carve more inroads into the semiconductor, especially the EV space. But to be honest, as far as I know, today at this moment, I can I don't think I would link uh, PME Tech to the um to the growth of EV directly. There may be an indirect indirect beneficiary, but I don't think they are direct beneficiary. Yes, I hope I answer your question. And Janet, there are many other companies in KOSE that stand to benefit. I think <laughs> they are your, you can just pick, pick your choice. Huh? Thank you very much for that. Thanks so much, David, for uh, doing this Q&A session uh, with us. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you just heard from the co-founder and managing director of Spiral Thinker Group, Sundar Hart who is uh, David Poe. Thank you so much, David, for spending your time with us, uh, despite feeling unwell today. For those of you who haven't checked out the uh, Bursa Academy, you may uh, visit www.bursaacademy.bursa.marketplace.com. It is a one-stop uh, e-learning platform that aims to give you a lot of uh, financial and investment information. There are investment quizzes, coursework, um, articles, uh, video recordings for you to learn about investing on in a Bursa Malaysia market. For our next webinar, it is titled The Top 3 Mindsets of a Good Investor. It's happening on the 4th of October. It is next Wednesday. 8.30 to 10 p.m. So if you want to learn how do you develop the right mindsets uh, to be a good investor, you may register for the session that I've just given you the link in the uh, uh, chat box. All right. So uh, if you have any more questions, you can forward it to uh, alpha at spiralthinker.com uh, and uh, David and the team will do their best to address your question. All right. You. So, uh, yes, David, you want to thank say Thank you something? very much. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in until the end of this uh, session. Hope that we have gained enormous value from uh, this session today. And hope to see you guys in our next webinar. Bye, everybody.